Hello everybody, today we're going to be discussing one of the most controversial, impactful, and disturbing black and white movies ever made, All Quiet on the Western Front. The story of this film and the people who made it have set it apart in film history as one of the most important movies ever made. And to understand why that is, we need to look at the story itself. All Quiet on the Western Front was adapted from a book titled In the West, Nothing New by author Eric Remarque. Eric was a German soldier during World War I who fought on the Western Front against France and Britain. In the book, he used a fictional character by the name of Paul to use as a stand-in for himself and the horrors that he saw during his time at war. The book was first published in 1928, just 10 years after World War I ended, and then two years after that, in 1930, it was then made into a movie by Universal Studios. The world politics of 1930 were complicated to say the least. Again, World War I had just ended, and it wouldn't be too long before World War II began. So during this time, director Lewis Milestone, who himself was a veteran of World War I, decided to make a movie about this novel written by a German soldier. He didn't stop there, as nearly all of the extras and several of the cast and crew were veterans of the war themselves. So, at a time when propaganda was prevalent in order to maintain morale for one's country and military, they decided to make a film that would show audiences at large, for the first time, what war was really like. As you could imagine, that led to a lot of backlash, but we'll talk about that later. For now, I want to go through the movie itself, break down several of the scenes as well as the plot, and get across to you why it's so disturbing and why it's so important. Because at a time in history when everyone's patriotism to their own country was in such prevalence, this group of American veterans decided to make a film about the horrors of war as seen by German soldiers. And using experiences across continents, they joined together to send one message. War is hell. Perhaps nothing sums up the movie and the book better than the message that appears at the beginning of both. This story is neither an accusation nor a confession and least of all, an adventure. For death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. I'm also going to give a warning now. Despite being made in 1930, this movie has some very brutal depictions and bloody depictions of the war, so if that's something you're sensitive to, may want to set this one out. Why hello there. If you're wondering what I'm doing tired on this much lower quality camera, it's because I am at my limit. I have attempted to upload the video you are currently watching seven times at this point, with this current version being the eighth iteration. The reason being, the copyright system and YouTube's copyright system are horrifically broken. And despite my resizing, recoloring, background music, mirroring, and like five layers of visual edits at this point, I have been unable to upload this video in any region in the entire world. And despite my clips being fair use, YouTube's content ID does not want to hear it. So Glenn the Golden on Twitter told me that if you add a face cam to a clip, it can typically get by the content ID systems, which if you're watching this right now, it means it worked and thank you Glenn. I feel that the clips that I showed in the video are important to get across the purpose of this video and I don't have commentary to give you while I'm watching the clips because that's what the point of the rest of the video is. So instead, and this is an experiment for all of us to see if it works, I am going to be in the top corner of the clips you're watching passive aggressively eating hummus and we'll see if YouTube considers this transformative. So cheers to you two, we really couldn't do it without you. So if all of that sounds interesting to you in a dark, brutal, semi-depressing sort of way, which, welcome to the channel, then stick around as we break down All Quiet on the Western Front. But before we do that, let's hear from someone who is, surprisingly, in a much darker place than I am right now. Why hello there. You're probably wondering what I'm doing in the great outdoors, and the answer is I'm simply enjoying the magic of nature. And you know what's the most magical gift that nature has to offer us? That is right, today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. See, I lied to you earlier. I'm actually out here in nature because I've determined that Magic Spoon is made not by humans, but by magical elves. And I have ventured here far out into the wilderness to kill them. I mean, simply speak with them to understand how they made such a healthy cereal that is also incredibly addicting. 
For those of you that have seen my previous ads, you'll know that Magic Spoon is the low-carb, keto-friendly breakfast that's gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free as well. And you'll also know that Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs, and 140 calories per serving, but that doesn't matter because what does matter is that it tastes so good that I can't stop. Like, look at me. I'm out here in the middle of all of this and I bring this with me. Do you know how demeaning it is whenever you're at the campfire and everyone else is eating SpaghettiOs or perhaps an MRE and you have to use your bare hand to reach into a cereal box because you didn't bring a spoon? Do you see this? Do you see what I am? This is the YouTuber lifestyle, kids. Take notes. I've been fighting the ants over this for the past two days. And if you ask me if I had it to do all over again, I do the same thing because it's a problem. So if you wanna be like me, minus the crazy woodsman part, and get in on this fantastic cereal, now's the time to do it. Because today, if you go to the link in the description at magicspoon.com forward slash windigoon, you will be able to get your Magic Spoon order for $5 off. That is right, you can get in on this addiction, I mean healthy breakfast option today for $5 off by going to the link in the description at magicspoon.com forward slash windigoon. You can buy by the box or in bundles. Some of my personal favorite are the s'mores, the blueberry, the frosted, and the honey. Although I feel like you really can't go wrong or at least I haven't found it yet. So get in on Magic Spoon today and then join me in my search through the woods where we find the people who made this cereal and then just talk, I promise. Thank you all so much for watching the ad, and thank you so much to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video and my insane ramblings. It really does mean the most. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description, and we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. After the title card that I mentioned in the intro, we cut to two people discussing the state of the German army at the beginning of World War I. As they open the doors and we cut to the street, the tone is quickly established. The German army marching off to war are treated as heroes. Dates and specific battles are never mentioned in this movie for reasons I'll talk about later, but we see that this is taking place at the beginning of the war. A postman delivering mail mentions that tomorrow he'll be going off to be a sergeant in the military. The man he's talking to responds that he will in a few months as well, but the war will probably be over by then. In the meantime, we see women hugging the men as they leave and throwing flowers at them as they march through the streets as a sort of parade. They're playing drums and trumpets to establish the might of these heroes. The entire scene feels like a fairy tale, and it's supposed to. These men are supposed to be depicted as larger than life and untouchable, the way that people of the time wanted to view the heroes of war. Hold these images and the idea of this in your mind for when we see this same street later in the film. We then see a classroom with the windows wide open listening to the sounds of the parade as the teacher is urging the young men on to enlist now. The teacher speaks of how much these young boys are needed and how the fatherland cannot persist without their sacrifice. He mentions that others are joining as well and schools have had to be shut down because all of the boys went off to war. The teacher even directly mentions their parents, saying what kind of father would be so selfish as to not give up a son for his nation, and what kind of mother would be too weak to not send a son for her country. The men hearing this begin to envision what their idea of war is. They imagine the cheers and glory they'll receive as these proud warriors stepping out to fight for their people. They imagine the women adoring them and the prestige that comes with enlisting. Then the teacher begins to call on them specifically, asking why certain individuals haven't enlisted yet. One of the boys he points to is named Paul, and he says that Paul is a young writer. Again, the story in the West Nothing New was written by Eric Remark. However, Paul was his self-insert for the story. So the experience of Paul is the experience that Eric had in World War I. After enough prodding, Paul stands up and says that he will go to fight for his country, and with that, the rest of the class joins in. I wonder what you are going to do. I'll go. I want to go. Count on me. Me too. I'm ready. I'm not going to stay home. They all begin to cheer and shout as the camera cuts between the smiling and yelling faces of the boys and the proud, happy face of their teacher. The boys begin to say things that are laughably and sadly juvenile, like now they don't have to go to class anymore. One boy in the class, a boy by the name of Ben, has not yet decided to enlist. So his friends join around him specifically, and after enough convincing, Ben says that he'll enlist as well. 
With that, the whole class begins cheering and singing as they throw paper into the air and say they'll march together to go enlist. On the chalkboard behind the professor, there's a few phrases written. One of them is the opening to Homer's Odyssey. Tell me, O oh muse, of that ingenious hero who traveled far and wide. Again, mixing with the ideas that these boys have, that they're going to be great heroes who will be sung about and told through the epic poems of history. But after that comes a couple phrases that are harbingers for the story to come. The first reads, resist the first elements of passion. It's too late when you resort to medicine. And a third phrase that appears at the end of the scene says, whatever you do, do it wisely and keep in mind your purpose. Again, this introduction shows us the arrogant adventure of war and how these boys are ready to fight, although they don't yet understand what that means. For many who never fought in World War I, this scene exemplifies their experience of the war. To join is to be a hero and to fight is righteous. And what sets All Quiet on the Western Front apart from other movies at the time is that this is where the fairy tale ends. The story leads us into that revelation slowly, and for now we get the first hints of it when the boys go to boot camp. Also, I know I haven't really named any of the characters besides Paul. Uh, there's like six of the boys who are the main characters throughout the story, but if I was to just like throw out a bunch of German names right now, would it mean anything to you? So as people become relevant, then I'll give them a name. While in boot camp, the boys are talking about how excited they are to start fighting and to learn bayonet drills or how to shoot a rifle. The first dose of reality comes whenever their formal mailman, Himmel, the guy shown in conversation at the introduction of the movie, steps into the bunk as their drill sergeant. At first, the boys treat him the way they treat each other, saying they're happy to see him as a friend. But Himmel, who's all about order and following orders, decides to put them in line. He has them march for hours and hours on end and crawl through the mud on their stomachs. This quickly establishes that the war isn't going to be as fun as they thought it would be. Also, during this time, we start to get a glimpse of how impressive the cinematography and the sets are for this movie. Like in 1930, to get shots like this and coordinate movements of this size is very impressive. I mean, it's impressive by today's standards as well. It's just super impressive for back then. Also, nearly every extra that you see on screen is a real German veteran. Lewis Milestone wanted to ensure that the film had authenticity, so the majority of the training drills and the tactics that you see employed later in the film were taught to him by German soldiers. So in scenes like this, you're just watching Germans do what they did in the war. Because of Himmel's continued strictness, the boys decide to play a prank on him. They catch him out one night, wrap him in a bedcloth, and then throw him in a bunch of mud. Also, this has nothing to do with the overbearing plot or themes of the movie, but the scream Himmel makes when they grab him is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Like, legit, that <laughs> gets me every time. <laughs> After this, the boys are sent out to fight and finally begin to make their way to the front lines. Also, this will be my last, like, movie nerd moment for this review. It, actually, it won't be at all, but just to do it again. These shots of, like, looking through the window and seeing this group of men walk forward and kind of being detached from the reality they're facing and then cutting back to them in person, it's gorgeous. I love it. Shortly after the boys step off the train, they are met with artillery fire. A soldier, unrelated to our main group, is killed by the ensuing shrapnel. Ben, who, if you'll remember, was the boy who needed convincing from the rest of his friends, lays by this soldier's side and, despite Paul's urging, has trouble letting go of this fallen comrade. This is the first death that they've seen, and it happened before they even had a chance to fight back. Paul and his group continues until they meet up with the company that they're supposed to join into. This small group of soldiers who they're essentially refilling are the survivors of previous battles, meaning Paul and his friends are the recruits stepping in to work with seasoned soldiers. This is made apparent whenever they are very abrasive to Paul when he accidentally sets his stuff at a bunk one of them was already using. That's me. I invested. And this is where he lives. I didn't know. Well, you know now. Yes. Yes, of course. The boys remark that they're hungry, and after Paul asks where the food is, the men laugh, saying food's pretty much non-existent out here. Hunger is a reoccurring problem throughout the story, and it becomes apparent that the soldiers are very undersupplied. We see this as the group's only way of achieving food is through my favorite character in the movie, Cat. 
Kat is not only the group's leader, but you can also tell that he's been through a lot of war and is very much over it at this point. You can see this as the way he gets food for the group is by stealing an entire pig. And then in the following scene, whenever he returns to the group of soldiers, they see him as a superior officer and stand at attention, and Kat gets scared because that hasn't happened in so long and stands at attention with them. before he tells them that that's stupid and don't do that again. And then whenever Kat's friends see that all he brought back was one pig, <laughs> he says that he'd wish they'd just die already. <laughs> Are you crazy? There ain't enough here for us. I wish you three would get bumped off. I'm tired of feeding you for nothing. Cat is, as you can see, used for a lot of comedic relief, but he's also the cornerstone that the boys use to navigate throughout the film. As terrible things happen, Cat is constantly there to reassure them that it's not their fault and it's just a part of the war. In a weird way, he's sort of our straight man for a lot of the horrors we experience, because if he can witness all of this and still be okay, then maybe the others have a chance as well. After this, the group is deployed for their first job, wiring duty. World War I, for those who aren't familiar, was primarily determined through trench warfare. Along these trenches, barbed wire was continuously placed in order to stop any oncoming attack. Now, you can't do this during the daytime because the potential attackers will, you know, kill you for it. So at night, soldiers would quietly sneak out of the trenches in order to lay barbed wire. As they get off the truck to go to the front lines, there's this shot where several of the boys look back at the truck leaving as a sort of final send-off before their way home is gone forever. Keep this shot in mind for later. On their way to the lines, Cat begins to tell the boys about artillery and what it sounds like and that they shouldn't be afraid of it. Whenever artillery fire begins, all the boys jump to the ground and Ben, who's already at his wit's end, wets himself. Cat looks at him and says it's okay, that it's happened to better men, and as a matter of fact, it's happened to Cat himself. Yeah, never mind. It's happened to better men than you. And it's happened to me. When we come back, I'll get you all some nice, clean underwear. This is what I mean by he's always using his own experience in order to get the boys through it. Something interesting about this scene where they crawl out into the mud in order to lay the wire, the director went to his group of extras, which were essentially all German soldiers, and asked them to teach him how they laid out barbed wire. So these German veterans instructed the cast of how to lay out barbed wire, and several of the extras in the scene are people who did that during the war. And another interesting thing about this scene that holds no real value is this comedically large hammer that I think is very funny. While they're out there, a flare is launched before artillery and gunfire begin. They all make it back to the trench except for Ben, who gets caught out in the field and he is then blinded by ensuing explosions. And for audiences in the 1930s, who obviously knew that people died in war, but perhaps never considered the harrowing nature of battle this scene was a shock. As Ben begins to run the wrong direction, he is cut down by gunfire. One of the boys, Kimmerick, decides to go save him. After bringing Ben back and laying him in the trench, Kat asks Kimmerick why he would do that. And Kimmerick says that it's his friend, it's Ben. And Kat says it's just a corpse and definitely not worth your life. This is in stark contrast to everything that the boys have been taught. Sure, they knew that it was possible to die in the war, but even then there was this valor to it and the idea that everyone is treated as heroes, even in death. But as they stand in front of no man's land, and a field of bodies, both friend and enemy, who no one can bring back home, the valor begins to fade. We then see that the group is staying in a dugout on the front lines, as artillery fire is constant through every hour of every day. The ground rattles and shakes, and there are rats running between their feet. They mention that this has been going on for five days, and Kat says two more makes a week, and then you can say that you've really been under fire. Again, Kat continues to be the foundation for the rest of the group. An officer steps into the dugout and mentions that two other dugouts have been wiped out, which is not what this group wants to hear. 
The officer is very casual and remarks that he'll try to get the boy some food, as they've been several days without eating. Through this scene, you can see the madness and paranoia on the faces of these men. Things like shell shock and PTSD were just now stepping into the public consciousness. And just as earlier with Ben's death, if you were watching this movie in 1930 and not yet considered the horrors of trench warfare, then this scene would also be a shock. To keep him from screaming and trying to run away, Cat knocks out Kimrick. However, a few moments later, when Cat's distracted, Kimrick tries to make a run for it. He runs through the trenches and tries to go over the top before artillery fire takes him out. He's still alive and is carried behind the lines to a field hospital. After this, we see that the men get a loaf of bread and have to fight over it not only between each other, but the rats in the trench as well. Then shortly after this, and after days of bombardment, the shelling stops which means that the French are about to attack. The men quickly line up on the trench and place their rifles over the top, waiting for the French to arrive. Some of the shots in this scene of the men in the trenches and the quiet of no man's land are incredible. Scenes like this are really structured like a horror movie. There's this tension that builds up as the men are aiming down their sights in a moment they've waited months for at this point, anticipating the allies to rise out of their trench and come attack them. Finally, as the French begin to charge, German artillery begins to fire back, and hundreds are killed before they ever get a shot off. There's this scene as Paul is watching this unfold. He sees a French soldier reach up to the barbed wire and wrap his hands around it to try to pull himself up before he is hit by an explosive directly, and whenever the smoke clears, all that's left are his two hands gripping the wire. It turns out that this shot came directly from one of the German extras who were working on the movie. While discussing the trench scene, one of the German extras mentions that during the beginning of an engagement, he had watched a French soldier grab onto the barbed wire, get blown up, and all that was left were his hands hanging on the wire. And Lewis Milestone felt that this was impactful enough to recreate it in the film. I think about these hands a lot. Because... There was a real French soldier who fought in World War I who died in an instant, quicker than he could process it, and all that was left of him were his disembodied hands. So a soldier on the enemy side who witnessed that would survive the war and years later speak to an American filmmaker about his hands, and that filmmaker would immortalize those hands forever. All from a soldier who could not have possibly known what his legacy would be. It's bizarre to think about that this soldier, with his final moments in a future he couldn't have possibly envisioned, perhaps did more to fight warfare itself than one soldier ever could have. And of course, the most impactful part is that that is one of millions who died in World War I, and so many bodies left on battlefields that have their own stories to tell. But the idea of these two hands, physically above the battlefield, separated from everyone else, and that being the legacy of one life taken of many, there's something about it. The Germans begin to shoot back with belt-fed machine guns and bolt-action rifles. Eventually, the French make their way to the German trenches and begin to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They fight with bayonets and knives and shovels and their fists. In 1930, it was considered pretty obscene to depict someone dying by any manner on camera. And here we have a brutal, violent fight, even by today's standards. The way these men are depicted, men who we've seen both in moments of laughter and terror, now with these grizzled faces as they begin to plunge knives into men whose name they'll never know, is a lot by today's standards, and in 1930, earth-shattering. Because at the time, while the general public loved the idea and the glory of the soldier, they didn't want to think about the brutality of it, or the menacing nature of warfare itself. I mean, it's the same thing by today's standards, right? When's the last time you saw a military recruitment campaign that showed actual warfare? It's always just the cool guy hero shots, and college, for some reason. Audiences at the time loved the idea of the blood, guts, and glory of war, as long as you leave out the blood and guts where all quiet on the Western Front just left out the glory. 
The Germans evacuate and run from the French before the French are stopped by German artillery fire and the retreat is flipped. There's a shot as the French are shooting at the advancing Germans and we see a sort of camera track down the trench line as the men are being cut down. And what's important about this scene is it is a direct one-to-one -one mirror of the same scene we saw depicted when the Germans were shooting the French. The two shots, aside from direction, are nearly identical to each other. It's as if the only difference is the direction they're walking and the uniform they're wearing. As the survivors of the battle are relieved by the advancing cavalry, the men have a moment to rest. From the remains on the battlefield, they cut blood from bread and break open bottles of wine in a moment of rest. The next day, whenever the men get to walk behind lines in order to get some real food, the chef tries to stop them, saying that he's made food for 150 people and asks why only 80 are here. And that's because of the 150 men in the company, only 80 have survived. There's a short fight. Cat threatens to kill the chef, which is pretty standard for him. In other words, bad food that ever drew a cook wagon. And you're scared of shows. All we want to hear out of you is one more little yip and we'll cut you up and eat you raw. Before an officer breaks it up and the men get to eat. The men have a conversation about why they're here in the first place. And I understand by today's standards, you know, this isn't anything earth shattering like, oh, war bad, how controversial. But in 1930, while certainly not a new debate by any means, it certainly wasn't as loud. So when the men say things like, Me and the Kaiser felt just alike about this war. We didn't either of us want any war, so I'm going home. He's there already. Somebody must have wanted it. Maybe it was the English. No, I don't want to shoot any Englishman. I never saw one till I came up here. And I suppose most of them never saw a German till they came up here. Oh, I'm sure they weren't asked about it. Nah. Well, it must be doing somebody some good. Not me and the Kaiser. I think maybe the Kaiser wanted a war. You leave us out of this. I don't see that. The Kaiser's got everything he needs. Well, he never had a war before. Every full-grown emperor needs one war to make him famous. Why, that's history. Yeah, generals too. Sure. They need more. Manu and manufacturers, they get rich. Mm. It goes a long way. Neither side wanted the war. And aside from kings, generals, and businessmen, it seems that no one's winning either. The boys go to see Kimrick. If you'll remember, he's the one who ran out of the trench and was injured by mortar fire before the main battle began. When they get there, Kimmerich says that he feels a sharp pain in his foot, but when the men look down, his foot's been amputated. This sends Kimmerich into a whirlwind, as he feels he'll never be able to walk the same again. His friend Mueller is immediately like, oh, those are some cool boots you got, since uh, you won't be needing them. If you're not going to be using these fronds, why don't you leave them with us? What good are they to you? I can use them. My boots give me blister after blister. And while that may sound very cold to say to someone who just lost a foot, it's more so the boyish ignorance that these kids have. He doesn't recognize the psychological damage or the weight of what's happening. He's just a kid who likes his friend's boots. Paul stays by Kimrick's side, and after remarking that Kimrick will get better... I don't think so. Kimrick says that he won't, and to give his boots to Mueller and send his watch back home. Paul tries to get a doctor to help, saying that the patient with an amputation's in trouble. The doctor remarks that he's done over a dozen amputations today, and he's got another one to go do right now. People are dying constantly. To the hospital, Kimrick's another cot that needs to be refilled. And whenever we see Paul leave the hospital while holding Kimrick's boots, we know that Kimrick didn't make it. There's this interesting series of shots where we see that Mueller gets the boots and while wearing them, he gets killed. We then see the boots go on to another soldier and then while wearing them, he gets killed. And it's not to say that perhaps the boots are some bad omen, at least not directly, but more so just the idea that these soldiers keep dying and their equipment's lasting longer than they are. It's just to show that boys keep dying and the war keeps marching on. While the group is again in another dugout, we hear that a man got a letter from his wife at home and begins to feel homesick that a woman shouldn't have to take care of a farm by herself and he really wants to get back to her. Keep this guy in mind for later. At the same time, Himmel, the drill sergeant and previous mailman from the beginning of the movie, 
shows up to the trenches. This is his first time on the front lines. And here, as soon as he tries his whole bossy stand at attention thing, they don't care for it. Who's your friend? Would somebody give General Ludendorff a nice, comfortable chair? Come <laughs> <laughs> like on, Jewish or superior officer! Do you want to be caught, Marshal Bates? I do. It's going to be a big attack tonight, and I'd just love to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> will, you, will you obey my orders? Kiss my foot. <laughs> <laughs> It isn't customary to ask for salutes here. I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to attack a town that we tried to take once before. Many killed and many wounded. It was great fun. This time you're going with us. If any of us stops a bullet, before we die, we're going to come to you, click our heels together and ask stiffly, please, Sergeant Himmelstoss, may we go? You, you'll pay for this, you. <laughs> <laughs> The next day during battle, Paul begins to smile at Himmel, knowing that he's now going to have to face combat. And sure enough, as gunfire begins and they charge forward, Himmel gets scared and cowers in a trench. Paul begins to tell him to get up and fight, and Himmel makes <laughs> more funny noises. <laughs> Until an officer who's running nearby tells them to push forward. And surprisingly, having now an official order, Himmel agrees and pushes on. It's weird, this moment of character. I expected Himmel to just kind of be the comedic relief as an overly strict sergeant. But after this scene, it's almost as if that was Himmel's comfort. The reason he was so strict and overbearing is because war is horrible. And the thing he relied on, just as the men rely on Cat, is a superior officer's order and just following protocol. So here he gets this kind of pseudo courage because that's what the orders tell him to do. And as Himmel runs forward, he's cut down by gunfire. They continue to push forward until like the French earlier, they're stopped by artillery fire and forced to retreat. During this retreat, Paul falls into a foxhole and gets separated from his men. As the French begin to push beyond his position, he hides in the foxhole hoping none will see him. That is until the French begin to retreat and a soldier falls into the foxhole with Paul. During a quick fight, Paul pulls a knife and stabs the Frenchman, keeping him quiet so that none other can hear. After this, there's this weird moment of clarity with Paul where he realizes he's just taken someone's life in such an up-close and direct fashion. He goes down to the water in the trench and begins to physically wash the blood from his hands. However, the French soldier does not die right away and instead bleeds throughout the night. Paul begins to try to talk to him and says that he's sorry he had to stab him. That's just what he's supposed to do. Paul begins to try to help him. He goes down into the water and tries to filter it to get the man a drink. Paul becomes tortured by this. He starts yelling at the man that he should just go ahead and die and why is he making Paul suffer? Eventually, the soldier finally dies and Paul is broken. He begins to ask for his forgiveness and says that if it wasn't for the uniforms, the two could be friends. Oh God, why did they do this to us? We only wanted to live, you and I. Why should they send us out to fight each other? If we threw away these rifles and these uniforms, you could be my brother just like Cat and Albert. He searches the man's coat and finds his wallet and a picture of his family. Paul begins to lay at the dead man's feet and beg forgiveness, saying after the war he'll take care of the man's wife and parents and children. Paul feels broken, as he's never had to kill a man up close and then watches he slowly die. Another interesting thing about this scene is the actor who played the French soldier was named Raymond Griffith, and this was the final movie of his career. Raymond was mute, which adds another layer to this scene, as it's not only the language barrier that divides the two men, but the fact that the actor playing the soldier literally cannot speak to Paul. Raymond played in several silent films during his career, and with the new invention of talkies, or movies with audio, he was beginning to lose his stardom. So for his final role, he played a soldier from an opposing faction who can never hope to speak to his killer in the first place. Paul eventually makes his way back to his own lines, and while telling Cat of what happened, Cat says it's okay, and it's just because he had to kill someone for the first time, and it's not his fault, and hey, that's just war. The men have a few days to rest and go to a bar. While at the bar, Paul and his friends begin talking about women, and how it would sure be cool to see a few. 
The next day, while bathing in the river, they see a group of women walking on the bank across from them. The men try to coax the women into the water, and after the women aren't interested, they decide to show them that they have food, and then the women want them to come over. It's not mentioned a lot, but this is a hint of the position that the French civilians are in during the war. The war hurt everyone, and those near the battlefield, just as the soldiers, had nothing to eat. After a guard tells the men they can't cross to the other bank, the women ask them to sneak out later that night. Also, during this bathing scene, the men are fully naked, and while nothing's shown in the movie because all the sensitive parts are below water, that was considered, like, blasphemy in 1930. Like, this movie got blasted by a lot of groups, which we'll talk about, and one of the reasons it was blasted in the U.S. was for this and the scene that immediately follows. Also, while talking about things that were controversial but also funny, there's this one guy in the group named Jodden. He's one of Cat's men who's a seasoned soldier, so not part of the main group of boys. He was in the war before them. Apparently, they filmed a series of comedic shorts with Jodden, like in character in World War I, just doing comedic stuff because audiences liked him so much. And next to Cat, he is my favorite character in the film. So that night, the men sneak out, again naked, to go see the French women, and after the women give them clothes to wear, they give the women the food, and the women are very excited to see the food, and then they romance the women. Now, nothing is shown, there's nothing explicitly said either, but what we get is a shot of an open doorway with the shadow of a bed frame cast onto the wall as Paul explains to this woman how important she is to them and the fact that they can't even speak the same language doesn't deter from the fact that he'll remember her forever. Now, this was over the moon for 1930. During this time, you never showed men and women hand-holding, for that matter, much less the implication of an unmarried man taking this French woman to bed. The Flintstones was considered controversial because it depicted Fred and Wilma in the same bed. Not doing anything in bed, just the concept of a husband and wife having one bed instead of two. So this scene was a lot, but it is again accurate to the experience of several soldiers. These boys want to carry out the dreams they've had for the rest of their life, like being with women. And despite seeking comfort, the only women they could be with are ones who could never possibly understand them. And this scene, while maybe not comfortable for audiences at the time, was certainly accurate. The next day, as they begin to march out into battle, they're attacked by artillery fire, and for the first time, Paul is injured by shrapnel. He's also injured alongside his friend Albert, and the two of them go to a Catholic hospital. While there, a man named Hamaker, who's been in the hospital for a while, explains to them that as soon as someone dies or is close to death, they immediately move them from the bed and take their clothes so that they can put someone in their place. Because the battlefield never has a shortage of dying men. This is shown as when a man collapses, within seconds, the orderlies have already remade the bed. Paul's friend Albert has both of his legs amputated, and as he struggles to come to terms with this, Paul is sent home on leave. As Paul goes home, he's certainly a different man from the one who left. He's now disillusioned and broken from the things he's seen. Remember that street we saw earlier with the parade and cheering women as these proud heroes march off to war? Well, here's that street now. Businesses going under as the economy begins to collapse and a child playing with a soldier's kit. As Paul gets home, he's greeted by a sister and then wishes to see his mother, who's become very ill. There's something about this scene as Paul comes home to his mother, and I don't know if they told Beryl Mercer, the actress who plays Paul's mother, if this was her son, <laughs> or if she's to act like it's her son returning for more, but man, her performance gets me. Here I lie and cry instead of being glad. Anna, get down the jar of blackberries. You still like them, don't you? There's this melancholy to the entire time Paul's home, where despite being in his old house and wearing his old clothes, he's not the same boy who last put them on. 
This is emphasized whenever Paul goes to eat with his father and his father's friends. Among them is the teacher who convinced Paul and his friends to go enlist. As they toast him and talk about his valor in the war, the teacher begins to say how marvelous it is that he's a soldier fighting for the fatherland. There's also this really quick mention that says a lot without saying a lot that I appreciate. As the teacher is talking to Paul, he says this. After all, you do at least get decent food out there. Naturally, it's worse here. Naturally. But the best for our soldiers all the time. That's our motto. The best for our soldiers. The best for our soldiers. But as we know, the soldiers have barely anything to eat at all, and what they do get is scraps and leftovers. Because the people back home, whose country is falling apart, are being told that, no, it's not because we can't supply food, it's just because we give the best to our boys on the front lines. But as we know, there is no best. This is all there is. And the propaganda that these people believe is that they are suffering for the betterment of others. And the people on the front lines believe that they are suffering for the betterment of others. But in actuality, everyone's suffering together. As they're talking, the teacher begins to pull out maps of the battlefield and immediately begin wargaming to Paul, talking about what the army needs to do in order to win the war. And as Paul begins to say that this is the last thing he wants to hear about, and how terrible battling on the front lines really is, the teacher begins to tell him, well, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, sure, you know the battle and warfare, but I'm actually smart and have read books, so therefore I know how this war's supposed to play out. And then from that, all of the men, besides Paul, begin arguing what the best strategy of the German army really is. And as they begin to yell and shout, Paul just gets up and leaves, and they don't even notice. Like I said, Paul is used to show the experiences of the author, Eric Remark. And while everything that Paul's seen is a conglomeration of Eric's own experience and the experience of other veterans, as mentioned like with the hands on the barbed wire earlier, Eric particularly talked about how whenever he got home, the men would constantly be pressing him to talk about how great war is. And whenever he would answer with the horrors of war, they would say, oh, well, you just don't know what you're talking about then. And while it's easy to condemn these people for their ignorance in the face of reality, and the story does here in just a moment with the teacher, but this is the same mindset that the boys had setting off to war. It took a lot of death and a lot of heartbreak for them to realize how brutal warfare really is. The movie never has a moment where it sits down and looks at the camera and says, war is always immoral, and if you ever fight anyone for any reason, that's bad. Instead, it serves as a warning for mindlessly sending boys out to die in someone else's war. And it does that simply by just portraying stories that soldiers experienced. That opening sequence at the beginning, this is not a condemnation or a confession. Steven Spielberg once said that all war movies are inherently anti-war. And while I believe the truth is a bit more nuanced to that, there is truth in that, because simply showing warfare is the biggest proponent against it. The next day, as Paul is walking through town, the teacher asks Paul to come speak to a group of boys about how great the war is and how they should all join up in order to save the fatherland. And when Paul gets there, he does not do that. I can't tell you anything you don't know. We live in the trenches out there. We fight. We try not to be killed. Sometimes we are. That's all. No. No, Paul. I've been there. I know what it's like. That's not what one dwells on, Paul. I heard you in here reciting that same old stuff. Making more Iron Men, more young heroes. You still think it's beautiful and sweet to die for your country, don't you? But we used to think you knew. The first bombardment taught us better. It's dirty and painful to die for your country. When it comes to dying for your country, it's better not to die at all. There are millions out there dying for their country. And what good is it? Oh. Oh. You ask me to tell them how much they're needed out there? He tells you, go out and die. Oh, but if you'll pardon me, it's easier to say go out and die than it is to do it. Coward! And it's easier to say it 
and to watch it happen. While looking in the faces of these young kids who were in the same position that Paul was a few years ago, Paul says that he needs to get back to the front lines right now because he needs to fight so that more of them aren't needed. That night, his mom sets up with him, uh, asking him not to go back, and how he needs to be careful and get a job behind the line so he doesn't have to be in danger. And it's, uh, man, it's just, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> but Paul is not the same boy who left her years ago. He's now a different man who is determined to fight so that others don't have to. The next day after Paul returns to the front lines, he comes to find that no one he knew is still there, meaning more than likely, they've all been killed in one battle or the other. As a matter of fact, the boy out front is only 16 years old. So just as in the beginning of the film, whenever Kat and Jaden had Paul and his friends come in as replacements, now Paul is the seasoned warrior who is having more children come in to back him up. But as Paul is sitting there, sure enough, Jaden walks back in and the two are reunited. Jaden was out looking for food, so Paul begins to ask him of everyone who was there when he left. Westus, one of his friends, died while trying to save a wounded messenger dog. Where's Westus? The messenger dog was wounded. He went out to get it. And the man who earlier missed his wife and his farm back home attempted to desert, but was caught by the German army. Where's, where's Datering? He got homesick. You remember about the cherry blossom? I guess he never got over that. He started out one night to go home and help his wife with the farm. They got him behind the lines and we never heard of him since. He was just homesick, but probably they couldn't see it that way. But thankfully for Paul, Cat is still alive. And Jodin mentions that if Cat were to die, they'd probably have to call the war off. Paul asks where Cat is, and Jodin mentions the direction he is, saying that he's out looking for food. The two are reunited, and Paul begins to tell Cat of how he now feels like a stranger back home, and the war's really all he has left. Tell me, Paul. How's it at home? Have a good leave? And spots. What's the matter? Oh, I'm no good for back there anymore, Cat. None of us are. We've been in this too long. The young men thought I was a coward because I told them that we learned that death is stronger than duty one's country. The old men said, go on, push on to Paris. My father even wanted me to wear my uniform around. <laughs> it's not home back there anymore. All I could think of was I'd like to get back and see Cat again. You're all I've got left, Cat. I'm not much to have left. I missed you, Paul. Cat begins to talk and mentions that it seems like the war should be over, and it doesn't seem they've got a lot of fight left in them. Push on to Paris. You ought to see what they've got on the other side. They eat white bread over there. They've got dozens of airplanes to all one, and tanks that'll go over anything. What have we got? Guns so warm they drop shells on our own men. No food, no ammunition, no office. Push on the pack. So that's the way they talk back there. <laughs> but that regardless of what happens, they've got each other and they'll stick by each other's side. As they begin to walk back, a bomber flies overhead and drops an explosive. A piece of it hits Cat in the leg and Cat's now unable to walk, so Paul begins to carry him. As Paul is carrying Cat, a second bomb is dropped and this one seems to not harm either of them. But little known to Paul at the time, a piece of shrapnel struck Cat in the neck. And whenever Paul makes his way back to the field hospital, he finds that Cat is dead. Cat was Paul's final connection back to all of this. He hates the war and he doesn't fit in at home. And Cat was his friend. He was a man that he was close to. And really his only foundation that he had left to keep running on. So now, as Paul is stationed on the front line, it seems that everything's just kind of pointless. So one day, while waiting out on the front for something to happen, Paul sees a butterfly land just outside of the trench in front of him. Paul stands up and reaches out a hand to try to pick up this butterfly, and as he does, a French sniper spots him. And as Paul reaches forward, A 
gunshot rings out and his hand falls to the earth. We now have our final shot of the film, as we see the scene from earlier where the boys looked back at the truck leaving them as they stepped out on their first deployment, now overlaid with the graves of those who died in World War I. Every face who looked back, now lying among the dead. All these stories, all of these personalities and people we once knew, now among the white crosses in a field in France. And with that, we have the ending of All Quiet on the Western Front. As I mentioned earlier, the experiences of this story are based on the perspective of the author Eric. And obviously Eric didn't die in the war as he had to write the book, but this send-off to the character is how one of many deaths could have occurred. The title of the story comes from something that Eric read while he was at home while on leave. In the newspaper, he was reading updates about the war, and the paper was talking about Germany's great victories on the Eastern Front and how great the war was going, and then concluded by saying, in the West, nothing new. Although Eric knew this was not true, he had watched several of his friends die and battles raged on and knew that Germany was losing. So in order to keep morale high and in order to make the people think that it still means something and to push forward, rather than saying all of that, the paper simply said, in the West, nothing new. And with that, Eric is showing how the entire war effort, the lives and stories of these men were demolished in an instant between artillery fire and trench warfare and how their deaths amounted to cannon fodder. It was always someone else's war and they were just the pawns fighting it. And while we experience these characters, while we know Paul's relationship with his mother and his personal inner turmoil over the war and how all of this led to his death, that doesn't matter because he's just one of many. And as far as the people need to know, it's all quiet on the Western Front. Now, as mentioned, when this movie came out, in the United States, there were various groups who didn't like the violence and, you know, the mentioned Kith content. It was critically acclaimed, and several viewed the violence and graphic scenes depicted as necessary for getting across the movie's point. As a matter of fact, in 1931, the movie became the first film to win both the Best Picture and Best Director at the Oscars. And to this day, it's gone down in history as one of the greatest American films ever made. However, at the time, especially in Europe, this wasn't the case. In Germany, in the early 30s, several nationalists, who would eventually go on to be a part of the Nazi party, would storm the screenings of the film and begin releasing rats or throwing stink bombs into the audience. The movie was considered anti-German by them because it depicted the deterioration and eventual loss of the German military. Whenever the Nazi party came to power, the book and the film were outright banned. However, in the early 30s, in countries like Switzerland and France, the movie would show to packed houses, and trains would take people from Germany into other countries so that they could watch the film. Lou Ayers, the actor who played Paul in the film, was a conscientious objector during World War II. Because of that, several of his movies were banned from playing in theaters in the United States. Eventually, Lou would join the Medical Corps and served as a medic in the Pacific Theater and was under fire on several occasions. When speaking of this, Lou would say, To me, war was the greatest sin. I couldn't bring myself to kill other men. During World War II, as I mentioned, the film was banned in Germany for being anti-German and, ironically, was banned in Poland for being pro-German. It should also be mentioned that the American military, who was asked to help out with several of the scenes in the movie and the sets, did not cooperate because, again, seen as pro-German. And I think that kind of proves the movie did what it tried to do. Every side, or at least every militaristic side, didn't want to claim it, saying that it didn't outline the points they wanted to, or didn't represent what they wanted to, or blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, those who were pushing for war, or wanted war, didn't want anything to do with it, because it messed with their narrative. And of course, the ideas of war being terrible and we shouldn't send our sons to die for our quarrels wasn't anything new, but this was a new way to say it. Wilfred Owen, a British soldier during World War I, wrote several poems about his time in the military. And one of those poems, Dulce et Decorum Est, fits with this movie's thesis. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we curse through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to drudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, 
an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, a vile, incurable sores of innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell them with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Like I said, all quiet on the Western Front isn't saying anything new. It's just saying it a lot louder than some others can. And there's several anti-war films that depict warfare in its brutality that go on to do the same things and different things than what this movie did. Films like Come and See take war and put it in a subjective lens, viewing it through the eyes of one boy who is suffering as war toils around him. Full Metal Jacket takes several angles, looks at different men, and sees what their own suffering is and the different situations and turmoil that can happen because of the effects of war. And as a matter of fact, they are remaking All Quiet on the Western Front, and it's actually supposed to be out next month. This time, the film is being made entirely in German and starring German actors in the lead role. And while I am excited for it, and it does look pretty good from the trailers I've seen, there's something about people who were really there, putting together a movie about what really happened to people who didn't really understand or didn't want to understand at the time. And one of the reasons this movie is considered so disturbing and so important by myself and many others is we rarely get the chance to see people who were really there put their experience to film. But not only that, they made something greater out of it. If Spielberg's right, and it truly is anti-war to simply show warfare, then these filmmakers certainly did the job. And through their tales, the movie depicted a brutality unknown to many of the time. Again, I keep thinking about the hands of that unnamed soldier and a legacy that would supersede him for a century to come. Whenever I speak about a lot of these old war stories, I say that I feel it's important that these stories be remembered, and that these tales live on through us and beyond us. And it seems that myself and the movie would agree on that. And it's for that reason I think it's important to share. And hopefully if you stuck around this long, you think it's important, or at least think it's kind of cool, and I do too, and that's really cool, and I just want to say thank you for watching. I love this film a lot, if you couldn't tell. Um, I remember whenever I, I had heard about it a lot, just like, oh, it's the anti-war film, you have to watch it. And after I watched it for the first time, I decided I have to make a video on this. So if you've stuck around this long, hopefully you agree. Um, like I said, I really love this movie a lot, and I think it deserves to be remembered. Um, but that's enough talking about that. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I appreciate your all's support in watching me talk about a black and white movie that none of us were alive for the making of. <laughs> so um, you all are really cool, and I appreciate it. Unless there's someone who's like 91 watching this right now, in which case, you're fantastic. Thank you for being here. Um, but yeah, I love this movie a lot. I greatly appreciate what it did, and I just thought it was worth sharing with you all. Um, so thank you for watching once again. Thank you for the support on the last video. So for those who probably don't know, um, I botched the upload to the Frankenstein film, or the Franken film, the Frankenstein video. My, my head's buzzed um, so much watching movies for days on end. I know it was a, how terrible of a life I have. Um, really thank you all for the opportunity to do this, make videos like this. But I botched the Frankenstein upload because I tried to make it a premiere because YouTube's like, oh, premieres will help uh, engage audience. So I'm like, okay, I'll try it. And it ruined it. In like the time period when my videos normally get like 400,000, half a million views, it had 40,000. So I'm like, okay, I'll just try re-upload. But then that messed with the algorithm because it was like a double upload or whatever. And uh, I was just like, well, I guess this video is trash. Good job, me. But then you all uh, continue to show support. I think it's around like 
600,000 now. Uh, so it's really cool that after I thought I had just like ruined a video <laughs> that you all still showed up and supported it. And that means a lot. So thank you for watching that. And uh, if you don't know, <laughs> because again, I messed with the whole thing, there's a Frankenstein video, the video before this one on my channel. Um, and I thought it was pretty cool. So if you want to check that out, do it. And again, just thank you for being here. Uh, we are at 1.83 million subscribers, uh, less than 200,000 from 2 million. You guys are a blessing. Um, you, you really mean the most. Thank you. Uh, so on that note, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, spooky season's coming up, and I've got some spooky topics that will hopefully be pretty cool. And hopefully you'll enjoy. Um, so look forward to that. But for now, I believe that should do it. So... I just want to say thank you for watching, I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!